Good evening. Um, today I'm going to read about um, the cycloid layer. And I have been reading side by side two books. The first of these is The Dark Places of Wisdom by Peter Kingsley. And the second one is The Psychoid Soul and Psyche, Piercing Space-Time Barriers by Anne Belford Ulanoff. And I came to a surprising conclusion after reading Peter Kingsley. And what you see in the upper left corner of this video is the Temple of Apollo in Side, S-I-D-E, Turkey. And what Peter Kingsley was writing about in this book is that philosophy actually had a different start from what we imagine. It actually started uh, considerably before Plato and uh, the earliest person that he could point back to was a man named Parmenides, Parmenides. And what I discovered in this book is that the people who were worshiping Apollo about 500 years before Christ were actually, um, were actually doing an early version of psychotherapy. They didn't know it at the time, but it seems that that's what they were doing. And they actually used these practices for about a thousand years. And there's evidence of that all over the Mediterranean, all the way from Marseille to Turkey. And uh, Mr. Kingsley, brought that to my attention through this. He didn't say it explicitly, but that's what I intuit from reading his book. Now, a year ago, I heard a talk by Anne Belford Ulanoff, and so in that talk, she was talking about the psychoid layer. And uh, a couple of other videos I have uh, given some input on what the psycho what the psychoid layer is and uh, so I want to give that to you now so that you understand what it is but I think that this is basically the same thing that the people who were um, in this religion. They were called healers. Parmenides was called a healer. And so this is a healing that goes way back, 500 years before Christ, and uh, has been taken up again in the late 19th century by Drs. Freud and Jung and many others now. And so what Dr. Ulanoff has done is to take it a little bit further um, because she has been uh, using the basis as her basis of uh, the work of Jung. And Dr. Ulanoff is Emerita Professor of Psychiatry and Religion at Union Theological Seminary. So uh, she has quite impressive credentials. She's written 16 books on her own and six with her husband, apparently. But one of the things that, so this is her book, uh, the, the Psychoid Soul and Psyche, uh, Piercing Space-Time Barriers by Anne Belford Ulanoff. And in this book, uh, among other things, uh, she talked about the psychoid. And so I want to sum that up for you. I put it onto a single sheet of paper. Um, and she talks about, for, before she gets into the psychoid, she talks about three forms of psychic healing or sources of psychic healing. The first is that the analysand is expressing some, something that many also suffer. So the, um, 
the psychotherapist helps the analysand understand that they're not alone, that this is part of the normal suffering of being a human being. The second is that the analysand is connected to a religious outlook. And the quote from Dr. Jung, which comes from a from an essay from Dr. Jung, which is called Psychotherapists or the Clergy from volume 11 of the Collected Works, paragraphs 488 to 538. He says, among all my patients in the second half of life, over 35, none of them has really been healed who did not regain his religious outlook. And then, um, and then Dr. Ulanoff is talking about this third layer, which is, uh, or this third source of healing, which she calls the experience of the psychoid layer. And you may remember that Dr. Jung, in one of the YouTube videos that you can find, um, said, I have no need to believe, I know, I know. And once you've been into this psychoid layer, there's no question that you know. And so, um, so Dr. Ulanoff describes the psychoid layer and its uh, special quality of the unconscious in four, with four facts about it, which it's very hard to talk about, but she says, one, it cannot be perceived directly. Uh, it cannot be represented in word or image. It is unknown or unknowable. The archetype is psychoid, identical in all individuals, and only no, it's only known through behavior, emotion, and image generated. Two, it manifests both physically and psychically, two sides of the same coin. It's experienced as opposition, and um, it's on the instinct to spiritual scale, and that's the scale along which consciousness slides. So your consciousness slides along a scale between instinctual and spiritual. Number three, experience confirms it. It opens on to the unis mundus, the one world. Uh, it's one world where familiar binary ego no longer obtains. Um, it's often found through a synchronicity, non-causal events, that is religious experiences. Um, it has a sense of meaning and we did not invent them, psychoid experiences or religious experiences. It's a land beyond space-time barriers. And it can, it can be lived, but not represented. And it so happens that I caught two of my personal experiences with this on video in the creation of this YouTube channel. And so you can find them in a playlist called Breakthroughs to the Unconscious. And then um, the fourth item in the psychoid layer is that they transgress all boundaries. So they are the seed of future consciousness. They're known only approximately. They can be caused by circumstances and they're liberating, they break usual ways of knowing. And so that's a summary of what Dr. Ulanoff was talking about um, in terms of the psychoid layer. Um, and what I wanted to read because it's about healing um, is here. Just a moment.
So she says uh, at page 27 of her book, The Psychoid Soul and Psyche, she says, meaning and its paradox. Psychoid experience gives us a sense of meaningfulness that exists objectively, independent of our constructs of it. We do not produce it. It shows itself. Experiences of synchronicity throw together non-causally related things that impact us with this objective meaning. Yet we do not know this objective meaning unless we subjectively register its impact. And that's what you can see if you uh, look at my videos on breakthroughs to the unconscious on that playlist. And so I'm just going to abbreviate uh, a little bit about this because uh, I want to give you some examples of the psychoid layer so that you can understand it a little bit better. And so she talks about, on page 29 of her book, uh, the ubiquity and the aura of the psychoid. She says, I would add that psychoid experience exists everywhere, not only in transference and countertransference field of analysis. We notice it there, we drag it into representation and dialogue, but its seed of our experience but its seed of our experience of objective meaning felt subjectively of uniting with and other from our own route of access through the path of our individual lives and are uniting with a greater unity of reality. So we partake of the all in all in the particularity of our lives. Those many bits create an aura of possibility. Something is in being and we come to see it, know it. We feel the numinous here and now, a moment of great importance an aura that is a diffusion of or emanation of atmosphere, mood, tone, even an engendering sound that exists around us and among us in the reality that cir in the reality that circumferences all of us. Writing as I hear again the words of Nancy, whose dying I wrote about in The Wizard's Gate. Picturing Consciousness, 1994. In the midst of outrage and sorrow at her life cut short by illness, when still able to form words, though near the end, when looking at all the pictures she drew of her struggle to meet death coming to meet her, now mounted together on the wall facing her, she said, This is worth it. It's all been worth it. The psychoid level bespeaks possibility no matter the circumstances. I also remember my late husband's words, when flesh and spirit meet, each becomes more of itself. As a coda, I must note that trying to write about the psychoid, indeed touching it in any way, constellates being in its field. Again, coincidence strikes one's strenuous, repeated, and protracted efforts to present the psychoid quality of the unconscious in word and image is thrown together with the boundless, borderless nature of the psychoid field. Time dissolves, spatial limits disappear. One discovers one has been at the task four or five hours with no sense of passing time nor definitions of body in space. It is like trying to write water, but instead feeling taken under the waves and out to sea. It is like trying to write air and instead wafted up into currents above the earth and delineations of human life within time and space. There are side effects to piercing space-time barriers and no guarantee one makes anything clear. Yet, and yet, there hovers around such unhinging of spaciousness and of beyond-timeness 
that conveys freedom from constraints, as if ushered into where one belongs and contributes to the wholeness of the whole and is full of gladness to do so. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to page 23 for a moment, where she talked about the healing potential of the psychoid field. The point I am making is that touching the psychoid realm can feel like losing your mind as well as being ushered into bounty, amplitude, full measure, solidity that no matter how great the damage through trauma, these unconscious processes go on, they are to be accessed and people do access them and know joy and gratitude. Trauma, though not removed, can be depotentiated so that it no longer defines us. Okay, so that's the, pre pre that's the preparatory part of this. Now I want to read um, her chapter, which is Examples of Psychoid Quality of the Unconscious. Because the psychoid opens into a vast area, specific examples may help to illustrate ways it comes upon us. I list five, all of which show its possible healing effect. The first from transference countertransference field in analysis has to do with trauma. The second to do with self-inflicted violence. The third with traumatic wound to society. The fourth, a happening between colleagues that touched a long ago grave loss. The fifth, a man's experience with bees. Example one, murder. My analysis is telling a dream of a psychopathic killer out to get her and wondering if such cold bloodedness lives in her. On the way to developing this theme, she mentions in passing in brief condensed form that when she was six and her brother four, her mother cut their wrists when they were sleeping. She awoke from the pinch on her wrist and heard her brother screaming. That called others to the rescue. I felt complete shock. This offhand mention of something so traumatic was news to me. My patient clearly assumed I knew this. Did I? I asked myself. Had I known and forgotten this? How could I have forgotten something so vital, so horrific? Did I have notes on this? And if so, where were they? Doubt, confusion, a kind of blankness overcame me, and I flashed on my patient, often saying she felt overcome by blankness. She would say, I do not know what to do. I just feel blank. I am too confused and unfocused even to be in a painful state. It can go on for hours. I felt in my present blankness a crossing of time to the distant past of her six-year-old self in her bed of her childhood home here in the office session and into the hours of blankness in her present home, let alone my feeling of being nowhere clearly. I felt invalid. What is wrong with me as an analyst to be so careless not to be remembering something so terrorizing? Had I been told or had I never been told? Had this happened or was it now happening for the first telling? My analysis felt something similar, confusion, doubt, what was happening? Had she told me before? Why did she think I already knew? Did I already know of this murderous attempt and, and had forgotten it? Had it really happened? Had she forgotten it? How sh and how she could, and how could she forget it? Did she make it up? My analysis asked herself what was wrong with her not to know the status of this decisive event. That conviction, there is something wrong with me, 
was the name of her central complex, and here it was in the middle of this upending session when the two of us landed in a field of no markers, no reference points, no explanation for what was going on in what we were doing. This conviction of being fatally flawed was the madness that held her hostage. When she told me at the very beginning of her analysis, I have always felt there is something wrong with me. I knew something had happened to her that inscribed that meaning of being marred, blameworthy. That certainty repeated whenever misunderstandings or conflicts came up in daily life, or when lack of hope to be able to live peaceably and with happiness transpired. She was the reason. There is something wrong with me. We were both in the same emotional state, but got there by our individual routes. I was asking what was wrong with me as an analyst not to remember, to know, this decisive trauma in my analysis life. But it was not like a participation mystique where the two are in a state of identity and I pre an a priori oneness of subject and object that can mark the beginning of an analysis. Nor was this a scene of projective identification where something unconscious is the analysis mm -hmm where something unconscious in the analysand is projected into the analyst and pushes her around to display, at least inwardly, the tone or content or emotion of that part of the patient who remains unconscious of it. We were distinct reaching this state of crossing time, place, blanking of ego mind. I was experiencing my own version of what my patient suffered, I arrived on my own, not from my analysis pushing me there. I joined from my own experiences mm -hmm. of death of death dealing attacks and then blaming myself as if something was wrong with me was their cause. And then blaming myself as if something wrong with and then blaming myself as if something wrong me with me was their cause. We dwelt together, each from her own path in the human problem of murderous assaults and blaming others, not identical experiences, but shared focus on a problem afflicting the entire human family. In this event between us, revealing her mother's attack on her children, I dimly discerned a causality between her conviction something is wrong with me and this trauma, but causality faded, dissolved in the evocation in me coming to trauma of being killed from my own experiences of invalidation. What is wrong with me? I felt all those ways of not feeling right in myself, a lack, default, deficit. I felt evicted from the role of analyst, not knowing what is going on, turned inside out, unsettled in my symbolic grasp of what was happening, feeling both of us in confusion, yet ushered into something more. We stayed put, looking at the horror of the event of a mother killing her children and the horror of losing our minds. We sat we sat in that together in a sort of unity, but not a fusion or merger. What emerged was some reality pressing into us, a quality of reality that bespeaks a unity of us with it, mm -hmm. joining with a surrounding entire reality. These are not causal connections, but simultaneities, synchronistic coincidences, gathering everything up into a larger whole. We discussed this happening in, a, in subsequent sessions. We discussed this happening in subsequent sessions, crossing time and space, present in my office with time past in her childhood, with time past in her childhood bedroom decades before, and even into time future feeling this was heading somewhere as yet unknown. 
we inhabit a deep insecurity about our capacity to know truth to perform our respective roles as analyst and analysand. Somehow I knew not to press for every detail of the murderous episode, but to, re but to rest content with what was telling itself, the disjointed memories, the mental wounds mixed with physical sensations in her wrist and arm that would sometimes ache now in the session, like two sides of the same event she realized, like two sides of the same event she relayed. To press for every detail of trauma event seems perverted to me, turning the main purpose of reaching speech into pernicious curiosity. Also, emotional memories of such inflicted pain stir up monstrous rage at being so intruded upon, yet tact is required when such pain opens. Through confusion and self-doubt, we bridge the space of then and now with such questions as, how could this be happening? Analysts are meant to keep such major acts in mind. Mothers are not meant to kill their children. Trauma victims are not meant to think they are the guilty ones for a bad act. Like a meat, like a leap motif, we dipped in and out of this theme until another startling event occurred just before summer break in our work. She sent me a copy she made of a newspaper clipping she found by chance in a book while sorting books to give away. In bald, succinct, reportorial style, two, bar two paragraphs stated the crime, arrest, and imminent, hospital and imminent hospitalization of her mother by name for cutting her children. This factual summary retrieved both Mike and Allison and me from the brink of confusion and doubt. The newspaper established the externality of this event. It did happen. She did not make it up. She did not cause it. The scar on her wrist marked a dreadful trauma. She did not make a mountain out of a molehill. For me, I had not been told until that day I had not forgotten it nor lost my notes. My patient, thinking I knew it, attested to her being in the work, that here the thing would be known, secrets told, and an emotional connection forged. I repeated in miniature how I repeated in miniature, however, the cycle of confusion and doubt by temporarily not finding the copy of the newspaper clipping. Did I receive it? How could I lose something so important? What kind of analyst am I? I felt relieved finding it in my folder of notes, and both my patient and I felt relief to secure facts differentiated from their internal experience. The newspaper clipping safely returned us to the world of what Jung calls personality number one of everyday reality in contrast to personality number two, which was the psychoid field between us the pierced space and time, and with its porous boundaries revealed an emotional truth of the two of us as sister humans facing and working on the terrible problem of destructiveness in human life. As my patient said, it is important to me to be clear what is inside and what is outside of me. Yet she also said, and I understood it as a healing from psychoid experience, that because she saw I could feel unmoored as she did, both of us together moved beyond space-time markers to something bigger, both together doubting what had happened and our ability to know it, both evicted and freed from conventional roles of analyst and analysand, while in, them, while in them still, living something utterly real, pressing beyond usual space-time barriers. In it together, and linked to a bigger unity, all that made her know our work was real, trustworthy. She could trust me. She could trust herself. She could trust our work. 
I saw in the psychoid field she had, I had, we had together a living experience, a new living experience. This new living experience exerted healing effects on my analysis major complex of something is wrong with me. In the following months, a space was emerging between that conviction and her own most self. That space keeps expanding, that complex still bedeviling, no longer holds her hostage. An example that gives evidence of a growing distinction between herself and the complex's conviction was blatant and even with a brush of humor, though she was deadly serious in the emotion. She had brought some photos to show me of herself as a small girl, standing with her mother and father and some of her siblings. I got up from my chair and went over to where she was seated to see them. She said, when you plopped down in the chair next to mine, I thought you were going to strangle me. There it was, the root of the complex. If my own mother would kill me, If my own mother would kill me, there must be something really wrong with me. But to say it so simply and with a whisper of humor, we both smiled, gave evidence of a space opening up between a long-held assumption of her wrongness and where it came from, and her own actual self. She and I were having a new living experience of looking at something together and of a space opening between her and the complex. This space slowly enlarges. The condition of being ruled by the complex slowly changes into a symptom that, be, that can be noticed as a trigger to set off engulfment by the complex. Here it is again. Symptom slowly gathers and deepens into symbol pointing to what kidnapped her through her personal material and extending into archetypal force of human experience of destructiveness. Back and forth we transit, reaching perception that through our trauma we work on an element of human existing, both the horribly destructive and also what can come to release and heal all that energy to thrive in living. Well, unfortunately, uh, my wife is indicating that it is dinner time. So I think that I had better um, discontinue this now and uh, begin, uh, begin again. No heck with it. All right, let me just try to blast through. Okay, example two, violence. A second example, a patient worked hard to assimilate the trauma of suicide of a beloved other on whom he depended in his early life. Now a middle-aged man, he fell apart with telephone news that a childhood friend tried to hack off his head with a big kitchen knife. He lived. My patient was disoriented. He knew about suicide and its many permutations, and he felt all right in himself about his own past experience and working through it. But he was devastated by the violence and suffering of his childhood friend. He felt he suffered what his friend suffered, destructiveness made manifest, not as if he relived the, not as if he relived the re, not as if he relived the ruin of the earlier suicide in his own life, but that he was in the grip of his friend's ferocious brutality, that such destructiveness existed and could lay waste to people. My patient called me at night, pouring forth the event, and his being taken down into his friend's death spell. I could hear this grip of destructiveness, myself in it too, even on the phone in my kitchen. This may remind us of the primary identity that begins transference, counter-transference as archetypal constellation pulling us in, but it is not the same. Here we are distinct, not identical. 
it is different from participation mystique, perhaps more accurately includes and surpasses it. This is akin to perception we all we are all in life together, encircling us. What demolishes the other demolishes me, indeed, all of us, and we each experience our versions of it. Saying his friend is mentally ill, which he is, does not relieve it. That is our feeble effort to erect distinctions to protect ourself. This savagery lives in the human family, and its problem with annihilating forces is our problem. We hope not to be there until we are strong enough not to be broken by it. It is as if we three cross time and space barriers. His friend in hospital undergoing multiple surgeries, my patient in his home, and me in my kitchen all together in the current of destructiveness let loose against the self to kill it. All of us are now to work on what to do with this barbarity, how to guard against its contagion, live in the face of its erupting. We feel how, interpe we feel how interdependent we are. We work for the same bank. The problems you have, the problems you have afflict me. My problems break out against you. We catch sight of our living in an encompassing world we share across the ages. That also includes the joyousness of your solutions spilling over to me, or my scrap of courage emboldens you to speak from your heart in public meeting at a crucial moment. Evidence of our interdependence shows in the horrifying consequences when our mutual dependence breaks down and the most vulnerable among, and the most vulnerable among us, because least protected by healthy defenses, can think to do the unthinkable. Like the German pilot who plotted to murder 150 people in his act of suicide by crashing his plane into a mountain or the American youth who decided to shoot small children in Connecticut as he staged being murdered by the rescuing police. Example three. Example three. Psychoid experience in social life. This example shows the social side of what gets eclipsed from consciousness, cut out of social history, just as traumatic events get banished from personal narrative with the same dire consequences of dragging deadness into aliveness, or worse, by burying something alive. These instances do not get recognized in tales of family lore, or in records of towns past, or in nations textbooks of its history, but nonetheless exist and press to get into awareness and usher us into psychoid quality of the unconscious as they emerge. They are present but not known, not shared and talked over among us, not admitted into our social life to be repaired, mourned, healed. To reach them, which happens in an unexpected psychoid field that emerges between people, is to feel that disordering of the world of personality, number one, to reach another realm of truth that has been denied and lives in hiding. My analysand worked hard to recover his awareness, to recover his awareness, to recover to his awareness, missing pieces of himself, hiding in flatline moods, and to address his major fear that he would not show up for the rest of his life. He uncovered important bits that expanded his capacity to reach tremendous human feelings without, as Winnicott would say, excessive organization of defense, excessive de excessive organization of defenses against anxiety.
Along these lines, he mulled over his life in the south of the United States, to which he was deeply attached. Dreams brought images of his grandparents and great-grandparents, and with a favorite aunt, he talked over the lives of these people her wor who were her parents and grandparents. He pressed for details of their lives and learned, yes, of course they were landowners, not plantations, but land of some acres. Pressing further about how they farmed their land, he discovered from his aunt that they had help. What kind of help? Well, African-American helpers, then called mm -hmm. Negroes, she said. Then he said to his aunt, you mean slaves? A long silence ensued, he said, holding him and his aunt. The word slaves sunk in and in. With tears in her eyes, his aunt said, we didn't call them that then. His tears met hers, and I found myself moved by this recounting, drawn into the wound with which I believe we Americans as a nation still have not come to full terms. It still inflicts hurt of very deep shame and rage. So my patient, his aunt, and I traverse time and space, our separate lives, then, now, north, south. I'm leaving. They too, we too, and all three of us drawn into that realm of wound, both physical and psychical, covered up and now exposed of crushing people's freedom to be subjects in their own rights, of crushing people's freedom to be subjects in their own right with rights over their lives. My patient went on saying his aunt described how attached the family and the helpers were, especially this and that one in particular, who became friends and were educated with the family's children, with stories of mutual giving that supported the idea of shared affection. But then she said, when emancipation came, the helpers left. They just left. They were discovered gone one morning. No goodbyes, no ceremonies of leave-taking. That goneness sobered the enchantment of affection, countered the notion of happy togetherness. The missing side of that relationship entered history, bringing disorientation, sor sorrow, and recognition into our consulting room. It was as if no years intervened, as if we now granted living space to people long dead, crowding in with his aunt, all the helpers whose necessity for freestanding subjectness trumped affection. There's a footnote to this one, which is, lecturing in Australia in September 2014, I was greatly impressed by the public mourning of citizens past segregation and abuse of aboriginal of aboriginal people of aboriginal people there are moving accounts in museums of suffering inflicted and born and people bring up their guilt for it in conversation in museums of modern art there are exhibits of spectacular contemporary paintings by the aboriginal artists However, it was also announced on BBC News, February 15, 2017, that the government had failed to meet four of its five goals to support and improve the lives of the Aboriginal population. Redoubling of effort to do so was in order. Okay, two more. Example four, psychoid experience in everyday life. An example of psychoid experience in everyday life occurred by chance between me and a colleague who shows that such events come in many forms. I asked her, I asked how her summer was, and she answered that the month of August was a hard one, always as it marked the anniversary of her mother's death when she was an eight-year-old girl. This was news to me. She had been shuffled among relatives for several months while her mother was sick, not being told her mother was dying, nor that she did not, nor that she then did die. So loss and loss of experience of loss haunted her. 
Every August, she made efforts to honor the mother she missed having and could hardly remember, feeling again the up feeling again the upheaval and bewilderment around her illness and death. She said Kaddish for her mother. She went to see art because she had been told her mother liked art, but it was clear she felt miserable now, and these gestures did not relieve her heartache. I don't know what made me say this or hit upon precisely this. The usual curt the usual courteous constraints against barging into another suffering seemed to fade. I felt fleeting bits of abandonment and death-dealing events stir me, as if I was in the realm of bafflement about where was mother and what happened and how could this happen that no one seemed to notice the small girl. I said just what I, I said just what arrived. I know not from where. It spoke from that knowing that we do not know. Quote, but what will you, but what will you be doing for the eight-year-old girl who lost her mother mm -hmm. and had been left in the dark about it until her mother was long dead? What you what can you be doing to comfort her and receive her pain? Unquote. And and some such sentences. My colleague's eyes opened wider and tears filled them. You have done for the mother, honored her, I said. Reach to the small girl, do for her. Honor her. All four of us, my colleague and I, the small girl and her mother and more, myself as a small girl with her colleagues, small myself as a small girl with my colleague small girl my experiences of mother loss and hers all separate and distinct seem to join in a unity across time and space barriers of past now present loss now found crossing life and death mourning and discovery present misery extending into future pleasures to bring solace to the eight-year-old girl. I soon departed and my colleague stood up and with solemnity put her hands in prayer position and bowed. I felt the small girl being honored. I felt I felt the small girl being honored right there in the room, and I also, and I also bowed in her honor. Jung goes so far as to say our problem may also be God's problems. Working on them, suffering them, connects us to the center deep inside us and far outside us, what the Orthodox Christians call the existing one that brings great joy spilling over to each other. It may be joyous, too, to experience the psychoid quality of unconscious. We fall into it everywhere, always there, and can feel the gladness that peep and can feel the gladness that two people can meet in a day unexpectedly and feel that plenty there, ready to soften heartbreak, plenty available to re plenty available to reunite with a long missing part, as if all of us together unite with something more. Unite with something more that pervade and un <clears throat> unite with something more that pervades us. Example five, a man's experience. Is the psychoid known only in clinical relationship? No, of course not. After lecturing on the psychoid in Australia, a man told me he used to keep beehives. He described standing in their midst without protective clothing with the bees all over his body and around him. I perceived he received in this bodily way deep connectedness to the real. 
he said. He said, I loved my bees. So, uh, I'm sorry to say that I don't have, uh, so let me just say, um, that I am not a mental health professional, and so I can't give advice to others. Um, I would just urge you to um, go back and uh, examine yourself, and if you feel the need, find professional help, because I can't give it. I'm sorry for that. And I'm sorry I have to terminate this because my wife is furious with me <laughs> for not coming at dinner time. So I'm going to terminate just now. I'm sorry for that. Thank you, Sean.